This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at thebatmanuniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Hey everybody, this is at Tip G311. Uh, my name is Dane. With me, as always, is at Tip G311, uh, <laughs> so known as uh, Tim. Tim, how are you doing? Maybe I should legally change my name to at Tim G311. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should. It would just make things easier, I think. <laughs> yeah, just like uh, uh, I, I was thinking about the same thing for uh, Ava DuVernay. She should just go by Ava. Right, because because her Twitter handle is at Ava, uh-huh. so she should just go by uh, Ava instead of Ava DuVernay, right? Maybe that'll be a new trend going forward. Is that everyone is just officially changing their names to their Twitter handles? <laughs> <laughs> It'll make life more interesting. I mean, yeah. yours would be a great one, day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. I mean, unless you pick something like uh, Tim. 11 21 72 31 yeah. <laughs> underscore these, <laughs> you know I like these bot account username <laughs> with a million numbers on there um but what i've been meaning to ask you tim you, you know how i've gone on about the a's and mm-hmm. um, the a's being just being cheap um or whatever how are the the, the yankees doing with all their money and their new-ish stadium it's 11 years old now so it's not new anymore <laughs> well, I, i'd rather be playing in an 11 year old stadium than a 60 year old stadium or whatever 50 year old <laughs> well believe it or not the yankees are i'm not going to say being cheap but they're being financially responsible i guess they want to not go past the luxury tax so Uh-oh. they're trying to get out of that threshold so they're not spending tons of money like they're used to being the last couple of years so they just pretty much signed dj LeMahieu again which they needed to sign that was a big free agent re-signing so they got him for another five years like 90 million a lot of and it's kind of a lower base annual value they'll be paying him and then they just kind of got some made some bargain trades signed some relievers to like these small deals so they haven't gone crazy obviously they're still one of the highest payrolls of baseball not the highest because that is the dodgers i think the yankees right. actually might be third now if I'm not mistaken, but yeah, um, who? Uh, uh, Dodgers. It's either San Diego. It, and well, I'm trying to think because the Cubs got rid of some players too, so maybe it's not them. I, I wanted to say the Cubs, but no, the Red Sox for a while. I think we're ahead of them, but they got rid of a lot too. So yeah, so maybe they are too. It's either two or three, but they're definitely not number one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so so it, it's it, it's not as bad as. Uh, you know the A's. You you you're not hearing a lot of. Um, oh, we got this guy. He, he he's a really good utility depth player, sort of thing. <laughs> no, come on, Dave. The Yankees are never going to be as bad as the A's. <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of like oh, you play uh, right field. How about um, doing a little bit of catching? Yeah. <laughs> How does that sound? Uh, never done it before. You'll learn. Uh, we'll teach you. We'll teach you in, in, in the big leagues. You know, you never done it before. Uh, we'll we'll teach you how to play shortstop. It's no problem. <laughs> as long as we get to pay you the minimum wage of Major League Baseball, <laughs> we'll find a spot for you. 
Um, can, can you play first base? All you need to do is catch the ball. That's all you need to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never liked that stigma of first base being the most easiest position. It, yeah. You got to have skills to be a good first baseman. It's because if you don't, you'll the flaws will show and it'll show you how how not easy of a position it can be. Yeah, that's true. But um, I do have to say, you know, the A's, you know, it's like they, they, they always convert guys. I'm not sure if they're, uh, you know, depth guys necessarily. Um, like uh, Josh Donaldson, right, uh, when he was playing for the A's, was a catcher. For the, I always the, forget about that. <laughs> Yeah, in, in the Cubs organization, but then he he just decided to you know what maybe uh maybe we'll we'll play him at third base you know so sometimes it works out like that did yeah so uh so a is not I mean I'm sorry the, the the Yankees sort of cutting costs not giving out large contracts for like fifteen years um. Uh, Sort of being realistic, I'd say. Yeah, for this year. Because, you know, two seasons ago, they signed Garrett Cole to that big nine-year deal. So that was the big yeah. splurge for a few years. Uh, well, that's good. At least things are looking up for you, Tim, in the positive. Um, Still got to so, make yeah. it to the World Series, though. It's been yeah, since the new stadium opened. <laughs> so it's going to be 12 years we're going on. Since they won, made it to the World Series, let alone won. So that has to change. Yeah, you'll get there. Sure. As we, that's a lot of people say every year, and then that doesn't happen. So nothing's a guarantee. Mm-hmm. Even though they are projected to be the best team in the American League, doesn't mean anything to you actually play the games in October. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know what's better, Tim. You know, having a team like the A's where it seems like every year it's always scrapped for parts. You know, it's, um, and it, we're always selling guys, uh, or letting guys go or have a team like yours where it's like, you know, we are going to spend the big bucks, but we might lose in the ALCS. Mm-hmm. You know? like, well, I think like, you always like to have that. Trade-off. You always like to have that knowledge or hope that you are definitely going to be in a world series contending team, even though it might not always work out. I think I'd rather have that chance to make it every year than to kind of wish and hope to even get to the postseason (laughs) every year. So I'll take the Yankees any day, their situation, I should say. Yeah, that's true. Uh, But anyway, um, do you, do you want to do our fellowship of the ring minute by minute commentary? Uh, Our second one. Yeah. It still sounds funny hearing you say the Fellowship of the Ring minute by minute commentary. I will, I should say too, uh, like the last couple of weeks, I rewatched the whole Dark Knight trilogy on my new TV, and seeing the Dark Knight Rises again, probably maybe only the second time since we started our minute by minute commentary. Yeah. <laughs> it was a different experience and feeling watching it again, knowing that the minute by minute commentary is all finished and seeing those different scenes that we spent so long on <laughs> minute by minute. But it was a good feeling watching it, knowing that. And I saw this whole movie minute by minute for the last, what was it, seven years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you really dissected the movie. We yeah. really dissected that movie. <laughs> Especially that scene in Wayne Manor with... Yeah, um, exactly Josh what I thought of. <laughs> Every time that scene comes up, I'll be thinking of... How long are minute by minute commentaries worth for that scene? <laughs> it just adds another well, layer of enjoyment to the movie now when you're watching the whole thing. Or even uh, I'll also say um, it's a little more action packed um, uh, because it's yeah, it's just a little more action packed. Uh, is the the chase scene at the end that uh-huh. one's been for a long time, longer than I, you know, I remember. <laughs> sure. You know, from you know, um, uh, uh, Bane being defeated to the the Batwing going out into the ocean with the bomb. You know, it's, yeah, that is a good amount of time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, Fellowship of the Ring, minute by minute commentary. Hopefully, we'll get some some actual footage. Yeah, <laughs> not just the title card and the uh, 
the the film companies and uh, the music. Uh, so just grab your VHS copy. Grab your came out of VHS, right? <laughs> Flash of the Ring. No, I don't think it ever did. It had to, right? I don't think so. Uh, it probably would have been those two yeah. tape releases if it did with its length. Hold on, I'm looking. <laughs> looking it up right now. The Fellowship of the Ring come out on VHS. There we go. Yeah, it did. It did, uh, really? VHS and DVD, yeah. August wow. 6, 2002. Okay. Uh, well, I guess that kind of makes sense. I'm just thinking about it right now. Attack of the Clones was the last Star Wars movie to come out on VHS. And that was in 2002. And obviously, Fellowship was 2001. So I guess studios were put, still putting movies out on vhs around that time still but i'm not sure about maybe two towers or return of the king yeah um you can actually buy the the vhs tape for 9.77 on wow Amazon. see i thought it'd be like at some absurd amount because it's so rare now <laughs> but i'm guessing this is the the unextended the the, the regular yeah versions. i yeah. would think so yeah I don't know how they would fit that on two. Different I know. Was it a? Did it say what? if it's a two tape release? Let me see. Um. No, it seems to be one. Wow. Uh, just Do they have it on the lower speed? Because <laughs> you know we used to record things on the VHS player with slow speed, medium speed, and fast speed. Fast speed would be the better quality, but it would take up more space and less time. So it was. The quality of the Fellowship of the Ring on slow speed to fit it all in one tape. Oh, well, maybe you know. I'm, I'm, I, I've only owned this movie uh, digitally. I've never owned it physically. <laughs> so, I see. It was funny. Well, like Batman the Animated Series was first airing. I would try to tape it. Of course, I wasn't old enough to be buying my own VHS tapes, so we use we kind of use recycled tapes that we tape over stuff and always in slow speed yeah. to get more episodes on there at a time. But then later on, when I wanted to have the complete animated series collection on VHS, cause I didn't know at the time <laughs> they'd ever release it on DVD, let alone a VHS box. Set. So I had to buy this whole like high quality standard VHS tapes and tape every episode on fast speed, which would probably just only be able to fit four to five episodes on VHS. And there's over 100 episodes of that in the animated series. So around like 1998, I bought tons of high quality VHS tapes just to get all of that in the animated series recorded in episode order. I'd have each tape assigned for when each episode would air. And they would air in such unpredictable out of order sequences. So, but luckily, like around the early days of the internet where they'd have the schedule posted on the official Batman website on the kids wb and they'd show you what episodes were airing for the week i'd see which one it is plan out my tapes make sure i get the right one to tape it and record it in episode order it was just a big whole ordeal and probably by the time i got it all finished um i probably only got to enjoy it once because not too long after is when the dvd announcement came <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, I didn't know. I just wanted to make sure I had a good quality collection of Batman the Animated Series, though. I still had those VHS recordings somewhere. And if I didn't edit the commercials out perfectly, it would bug me, and I'd have to retake the episode again whenever it aired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was what I was going to ask. Is like, how did, so so they must ha still have the commercials in them, but uh, you you sort of stopped the recording as soon as the commercial started, and then. Start yep. it again. Once, uh, yeah, I was gonna say, well, well, why don't you go back and like um, see 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 what like the the most bizarre commercial <laughs> was on on those VHS tapes? Kind of like if you go back and read old comics, you can see like old yeah. ad ads for you know like video games and stuff mm -hmm. that you never heard of. <laughs> that came on and went away. Looking back yeah. on it now, I wish I did keep the commercials now having you know the official Blu-ray <laughs> releases of the series. It would have mattered that the VHS tapes I recorded had commercials. It'd be fun to go yeah. back and look at it now, but it's like, I kind of wish I did keep the commercials. But. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, just grab your VHS copy, uh, obviously available. Um, grab your DVD copy, grab your um, 
what else, Tim? Uh, your your beta, grab your HG DVD, grab your uh, laser disc. Could probably fit on a laser disc, right, Tim? The I don't know. Cut. Standard movie lengths, the you always had you always had to flip the disc. So <laughs> oh, right. I, t- I totally forgot about that. Yeah. I think it'd probably big two or three laser discs. Yeah, maybe not. Um laser disc, grab your um projector, grab your Blockbuster physical subscription, uh card, grab your Netflix physical physical subscription, copy, grab your um uh dvhs uh <laughs> and grab your our favorite the way it was supposed to see, be seen uh the way peter jackson wants you to see his movies <laughs> if you watch the big documentary features on the whole lord of the rings trilogy you'll hear peter jackson countly talk count, countlessly talk about this format <laughs> how he wants us to experience the lord of the rings <laughs> grab your uh vhs dvd converted copy so I'm going to give the countdown. Tim, are you ready? I am ready. All right. Three, two, one. Hit play. Up, oh, the logo's fading out. We might see some actual footage here. Yeah. Oh, there, there we is. go. Yep. <laughs> the forging of the great rings. So is that like special gold or something? I don't think it's really special material, but... Yeah. Obviously, they were kind of probably enchanted with some magical properties by Sauron <laughs> to control and wield them. Especially, yeah. obviously, the nine gifted to the men. So what happened to all the all these other rings? They, they obviously have some sort of power, right? Yeah. Obviously, the elves still have them, I know. Oh. Obviously, the nine kings of men, they all fell into Sauron's trap because of the rings and became the Nazgul, but... Uh, I see. I just love this how it goes from a narration to a map of Middle Earth, and then you get into the big moment of this epilogue, and yeah. not epilogue, but pre prologue. And man, that shot of Sauron! I remember seeing it for the first time. It's called man. That's a really cool looking design, <laughs> and just the cool uh, medieval type armor that I've seen here. And a good spot to end our second minute, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting it's already getting into some really cool stuff. <laughs> So, so how is he rep uh, pre- or presented in like the fan art and stuff? Would he he didn't look like that. He, he um, different. There, no, there's been some where his oh. armor is kind of similar, but yet kind of different design. And remember, this seeing the movie for the first time, I was not a big Lord of the Rings fan at all. I barely knew anything, so it was like experiencing the story pretty much for the first time when I saw the movie. So. I wasn't going in with any preconceptions or what things should look like or how it should be. I was just taking it all in and just being blown away for the first time. And then it was not until after I saw it, I started doing all this research and looking back at artwork, like official artwork done for the books um, before the movie and came out and kind of comparing how the movie looked to some of the other like official arts that was released. So yeah, so when seeing it for the first time, I didn't have no idea what to expect <laughs> or how it could compare to anything yeah. that I was already familiar with. Yeah, I'm just wondering what happened to all those rings. Like, like, I don't know, like how much did they create? Like, it, it, it sounded like they created like 25 rings, <laughs> and like the the one master ring, right? Yeah, that, the one ring to you rule. know is is the Lord of the Rings or whatever. Uh, so so what happened to all the other rings? Like, like, because they, I know the elves they, still have that, theirs, and I don't can't remember what happened to the dwarves. What they did with theirs? That, like, are they lost or? Like, no, I don't think they're like, lost. Because those are still powerful rings, right? Yeah. So, like, yeah. like yeah, you destroyed the one ring, but what about the other the, the the other rings? Because like that that could also be a problem because those rings have powers too. Yeah, right? I think without the one ring though, those rings might be powerless. Like that ring had to be still in existence in order to have those uh, rings have any effect. At least that's what I get out of it. Yeah. Uh, I see. Yeah. I don't know about that, Tim. I think <laughs> they're still powerful. You know? I'm sure they're, they're powerful than your av- average ring, but <laughs> I, probably not to their full potential without the one ring be still being there. And you know what I never really noticed? I, I, I know we're going on and on about this, but... Hey, we got uh, still three uh, three hours and about forty minutes left. Oh, I was typing discussion. <laughs> uh, so, 
in this movie, am I getting this correct? The elves are going to kill themselves, essentially. What do you mean, as far right? as going into battle? No, I mean, uh, I mean, they're going to like the Middle Earth Valhalla, right? Oh, yeah. Eventually, yeah. Well, that's where they're they're gonna go, yeah. But it's not like they're they're still gonna be immortal, but they're not just gonna live among among men and dwarves and on Middle Earth. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so they're kind of like latest. Yeah, that's why Elrond made such a big deal that in Two Towers where or Arwen wanted to stay with Aragorn because she kind of give up her immortality by staying there and not going with the elves. Uh, I see. So, yeah, they're kind of like elitists, right? Like they like, ah, uh, we're too good for this. So, <laughs> yeah, pretty gonna, much. <laughs> just gonna go go into our uh, gated community, the Elven <laughs> gated community. <laughs> They men ruined wow. the world already, so we're moving on. <laughs> Give it to you to deal with. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, let's uh, do our future topic for this episode, Tim. Yeah, so our future topic is going to be a pretty cool news announcement that we got about a week ago, which I was really excited about. I wanted to make that our main discussion because I really can't wait for this. And this was the announcement we got about the comic series continuing the story of Batman 1989. Not only that, but the Christopher Reeve Superman movie as well. They announced both of them at the same time. And this got me really excited because it was something that you kind of talked about for over the years of how cool it would be to kind of continue the Tim Burton universe of Batman in a comic series. And I believe those ideas were kind of thrown around, but never anything official came out for it but now it's happening we're officially getting a comic series based on batman 99 and superman uh, 1978 it's kind of what they're just being titled batman 89 and then superman 78 for the respected series and what's really cool about it is that for batman it's going to be written by the original screenwriter of the movie sam ham so i like how it's really continuing on from the original creative source who did the movie just we probably get to add that little extra layer of continuity that you'll appreciate more knowing it's coming from one of the main creative forces of the original movie. So there's just the potential of this is just really, really exciting. So um, instead of just kind of go over the basic news announcement about it, I also wanted to talk about some of the things I'm hopeful that will be in this comic that I would like to see. Some of it's already confirmed, but other things I hope get expanded on in this comic series that I think would be really cool. So just the basic first, the official announcement of it is that it's coming out on July of this year, and it's going to be kind of a 12 issue, I believe, uh, digital first series. Uh, and the announcement says the series will debut as six digital chapters on July 7th or July 27th. And then after that, there will be subsequent chapters released weekly for the following six six weeks. And then once those are all released, I believe the 12 chapters will release in a print format in six single-issue comics from between August and October. And then there's a hardcover plan to collect all 12 chapters in October. So I kind of remind you similar to how uh, the new Batman or Batman The Adventures Continue uh, release was. So and I really like that format and how it was a digital first. Um, so I'm hoping this is of that same quality because just like uh, Batman 89 is going to be the new Bat or Batman the Adventures Continue came from Alan Burnett, Paul Dini, the same creative forces behind the animated series. So I'm glad that's continuing here again with Batman 89 with having Sam Hamm doing it. And part of the th teases they released in the uh, official announcement as far as what stories and things we can see in this series. It says it's going to have the return of Selina Kyle. It's going to debut a new Robin. And then I think what everyone was hoping for and wanted to see in the series the continuation of the Tim Burton Harvey Dent, played by Billy D. Williams. And obviously, you know, we're getting Two-Face. A Billy D. Williams Two-Face, and how awesome is that going to be? So <laughs> just a few other things to look uh, forward to in the series. But again, there's a couple of things I hope they expand on as well. But before I get into that, Dane, what was your reaction when you first heard the announcement of this Batman 89 comic series? Yeah, for, I, I have two things that I'm looking forward to this. Uh, and I, I, I'm glad you let me go first because I know you have like 
75. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 89 um, or 89 things I hope to see for Batman. Yeah. 89. <laughs> <laughs> Make a great uh, YouTube video. Um, but um, yeah, number one, Bob. <laughs> is, are we gonna, is, is Bob going to be featured in this? Um, what happened to his character? I guess, uh, or or are are we gonna see the the backstory of Bob in this? Uh, you know, two? I think there's a really plausible way to make that work. Yeah, it's it's Bob begins. Right? Yeah. Because <laughs> um, if you look at the movie, he got shot, but doesn't necessarily mean he's dead. Yeah, exactly. So, number two. There's a lot of purple on that cover, Tim. Uh-huh. Are we going to see? I mean, did, did they work something out with the Prince Estate? You know, are we going to see a little bit of Prince in here? You're going to see like a little reference to Prince here. Uh, you know, uh, I, I I hope there's a little bit of Prince in this. You know what? I think it, I don't think there's that unrealistic to think there'd be like a Prince homage in one of these issues. Yeah, either like a reference uh, or a character in there who looks like him or a Kind of how he looks in the Bat Dance video with that Joker yeah. makeup, or the half <laughs> Batman <laughs> look too. I think they can make yeah, that work. So, uh, you know, he played a big part in uh, um, a classic scene, I'd say, of Joker <laughs> oh, destroying the museum. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to see a little Prince reference or make Prince a character in this. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, those are my two that I'm looking forward to. And I don't know if you saw this, Dane, but um, the artist Joe uh, Quinones, if I'm probably butchering his last name, I'm sorry, but on Twitter, he posted some early concept or character designs for the book. And they were really cool. I wish they weren't early, but actual final <laughs> designs. Because for the ones for Batman and Bruce Wayne, um, I don't know if you remember the old Kenner action figure for Batman Returns, where you got to actually take off the cape and cowl and have a Bruce Wayne figure. That was such a big deal back then. I remember for me having a figure of Batman where he could be Bruce Wayne too. And the outfit and the shirt that he had as that figure was part of his uh, design for Bruce in this book. So I hope that made it to one of the final issues because I think that's such a great homage. But even Bruce in his early designs has him in the Batman animated series brown suit, which is a cool nod there. Then he had concept art of Alfred of Mike, the Michael Goff Alfred with a mustache, which looked great because you know how I've been waiting yeah. for a live action Alfred with a mustache. So if we can get a live action Alfred in a comic with a mustache. <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah. Then Harvey Bullock. Um, with... So 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 are they going to go like okay? So Bruce is going to look like Michael Keaton. His Catwoman is going to look like Michelle Pfeiffer. Um, uh, Joker's going to look like Jack Nicholson. Are they are are, are they going to go that route or are they oh, going to yeah. be like? Without oh, question. Okay. I mean, it has to yeah. <laughs> for you continuing on in yeah. the Burton movie. So it would kind of always be a little pointless if you don't, really. <laughs> yeah. I also uh, like to have, have the Pat Hingle, uh, Commissioner Gordon look, but looking more like Commissioner Gordon from the comics. <laughs> it, it does work. It has that <laughs> Pat Hingle look and uh, mix in with a comic book. Is he but actually going to do, do something in this in this comic book? Or yeah, is he I, just going to be like, oh, let's just wait for Batman to I know. Here. That's one of the things I'm excited for, more of that Batman-Commissioner Gordon relationship. Hopefully that this universe can finally get. But also going back to your thing with Prince, in his early concept, he has some designs of like a Joker gang, kind of like in Batman Beyond the Jokers. But in this one, there is a character that kind of has that Prince vibe as far as how his hair looked in this Bat Dance Mm -hmm. video as the Joker. So I think we probably might get a nod there. I wouldn't be too surprised if that does happen. Yeah, uh, you know, it'd be pretty weird uh, because Joker wears a purple suit, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's what he's known for. He, in almost every iteration of the Joker, he's worn a, a purple suit, right? Um, except for Jared Leto, I, I think, right? I don't think he... No, he did have a purple suit up, at least one scene in the yeah. movie. Uh, okay, well... Prince also wears a purple suit. So, like, are they are they gonna like have him in the purple suit, or or are they gonna change the color to it? <laughs> I, I, I it, it it'd be odd, but 
I don't know. I I I just want to see Prince in this comic book. Uh, I think you will. <laughs> I think there's going to be a nice like nod to him there. <laughs> yeah. We'll just have to wait and see what issue it is, but I think you're going to get one. I wonder how they uh, how how did they work out the rights to this like because. I, I'm assuming there's some sort of contract where, like, they had to sign, like, okay, so here's your contract, Michael Keaton. We're, we're going to use your likeness for this. You know? uh, yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah. I don't know how all that stuff works, but um, especially in the comics, I don't know if it's any different than using your likeness somewhere, like, if you were for a TV show or something like that. But yeah. uh, I imagine it's probably something that you would have to do legally to get your likeness to be in, in these issues. So whatever it is, I think they worked it out though. Yeah. Well, I wonder what the new Robin is going to look like. Yeah. That is going into one of my first things that I hope to see in this. Obviously they, if it, they already said Robin is going to be in here, but what I'm really hoping for is something I I'm expecting it to be different. It, not to be exactly how it is. It is origins in the comic, which, which is fine, but let's just, not have it be the Batman Forever route where he is already what in college or whatever <laughs> at that he's age. Already, he's already in his mid thirties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, that's, and uh... that I think it would just be really cool. Hopefully, in to see in this universe, Batman take on Robin, who is yeah. at that more younger age and is someone that Bruce sees himself in sees himself in as a kid who lost his parents and takes him under his wing. I hope it doesn't go again in the Batman forever route where Bruce is so reluctant to have Dick join him as a partner to fight two face and how he didn't want him be a part of that at all. When it should be the exact opposite where Bruce is the one who really wants Dick Grayson to be uh, his partner and to help him fight in his war on crime. So I really hope they go that route and I think it'd make for some cool stuff in this Burton Batman universe. So that's what the potential list is so exciting. And I'm wondering, too, if they're going to go this route. Um, we'll see. I kind of hope they don't because it wasn't my favorite. But do you remember that deleted scene? It was like only in animatic form. They put it on the DVD and Blu-ray release for Batman 89 in that box set where it was the storyboards of sequence of Robin's introduction into Batman 89, but it had to be cut. And it was cool because uh, Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill did the voices for Batman and Joker over that animated sequ- sequence of the storyboards. But it's how like they were having a, a car chase and during the chase, Joker um, shoots or kills Dick's parents as they're making their way through the, the circus. They just kind of happened to go through this. I don't know if it was an outdoor circus. It might have been. And as Batman was chasing the Joker, Joker made plow through the circus, killed Dick's parents. And that's how he kind of came into contact with uh, Bruce and Bat- as Batman. And I believe Batman was even on horseback at one point in that kind of little homage to what? the Dark Knight Returns. Yeah, He's riding so, a horse? Yeah, it wasn't my favorite sequence <laughs> as far as something that to introduce Robin into this universe. So I'm hoping they don't yeah. do it exactly that way. But part of me thinks, again, it's coming from the same writer. That was a sequence they had in the movie. So they might bring that back in for this comic series. Maybe they'll do something different with the joke instead of the Joker. But... We'll see. Yeah. I'm expecting something different, but I just hope they stick to those core elements of Dick being a younger kid and Bruce being the one who wants to take him in and not being so reluctant like we got later on. Or, you know, it would be interesting. Wasn't one, it, it was one of the the Wayans brothers, right? Yeah, it was Damon Marlon or, Wayans. Or Marlon, Marlon yeah. Wayne, If they used his likeness, because he was supposed to be in, is it, uh, for, <laughs> Not forever, right? No, it was Batman it, Returns. It was, yeah, Returns, right? Yeah, I think Burton yeah. actually yeah. cast him, yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting if they if they used his likeness. Yeah, yeah. I could see that happening, too. I think they're going to yeah. be taking some of those elements from the stuff they previously had planned and throw it into this comic series. So I could totally see that being the case as well. Yeah. I, that'd be a great idea. But Yeah, that's, again, it's just we'll cool see. that we're going to get Robin as how he potentially could have been if Burton and Michael Keaton continued on um, with this version of Batman. And then another thing I'm hoping to see is just the villains that Batman could possibly be facing here. Ones that you would never 
expected to see in a Tim Burton Batman film, especially back when these are being made in the late 80s, early 90s. Like, just go all out. Like, I want to see the Michael Keaton Batman go up against Clayface, go up against Killer Croc, and just some more of these fantastical extreme Batman villains that would have been almost impossible to pull off in live action at the time. And how we're still kind of waiting to see in live action. I mean, we still haven't seen Clayface at all in a live action movie. <laughs> I really hope we would see that one day. But uh, let's just go a little crazy now that this is the stories of Michael Keaton's Batman is continuing in comics. Uh, the potential and ideas you have are limitless. So let's go out there for a few extreme villains like Man Bat as well. I think that'd be really cool. And just on the topic of villains too, I'm going to call it out right here. I think they're going to do a retcon with the Joker. I don't know how, but I think they're going to establish that he's still alive and he survived that fall. Again, who knows how, but <laughs> they saw the body lying there with that laughing gag going on. But I just think that, I just don't think they're going to be able to resist having a Batman 89 comic and not have the Joker be back in some way. So that'll probably be something that might not get revealed till later on in the series run, but will probably eventually be the big climactic story uh, that Batman will have to confront as far as uh, a villain goes in the series. I think the Joker is coming back some way, somehow. So <laughs> I just don't think they'll be able to resist not having to write and draw Jack Nicholson's Joker again. So <laughs> we'll see how they do it, but I think that's going to happen. And then finally, this is the main thing I'm really hoping to get in this story. And this is kind of a lot of wishful thinking for just a 12 it's 12 chapter series so <laughs> it might be a lot to cram in but i think it would be really cool if they just really at least for one issue dived into bruce's training to becoming batman in this universe i mean we had pretty much gotten nothing of that in the first two tim burton films we obviously saw the origin of thomas and martha wayne being killed by jack napier and bruce seeing that as a young kid but i think it'd just be really cool if they just devoted a chapter or two really delving into what Bruce did after that. As a young kid, as a young adult, seeing where he went to train, he obviously made reference to going to Japan in the first movie so we could see that in the comics. That would be great. Just kind of really have its own Batman Begins type story in this comic for Michael Keaton's Batman. That would be awesome to me. Just seeing the training he did, what made him become Batman as far as the idea to dress up as a bat, is it going to be like the year one comic where the bat flew through the window and that gave him inspiration? Is it going to be something entire, entirely new? It would just There's a great opportunity here to do something different, but yet still keep to that classic true Batman origin story uh, for Michael Keaton's Batman here. I just think it would be such a crime, honestly, if you have an opportunity to flesh out this version of Batman more and don't dive into uh, more of his origin and his training and how he became Batman, and even his first night out as Batman. Uh, because we know in Batman 89, um, Batman is still fairly recent as far as making his presence known in Gotham. So if we get, were able to see his first night out as Batman, that would be great. Just seeing all that went into Bruce preparing for that moment. I think it would be really cool to get that backstory for this version of Batman. So again, it's something that obviously they have a story plan here with a lot of characters in these 12 part series but if we could just get one chapter devoted to batman's origin here or even maybe little sequences sprinkled throughout each chapter with some flashbacks of bruce uh, preparing to be batman i think that would be really really cool um and then so that's the most important thing i really hope to see in this comic i just think that would be amazing but then also just on a pure uh fanboy wishing thing they announced batman 89 and superman 78 i think they got to have a, plot, a crossover plan at some point. <laughs> maybe once these two series finish their initial run, maybe they could do a special where we see the Christopher Reeve Superman and the Michael Keaton Batman team up for one cool epic story. And I think that would just be really awesome. So, yeah, just a lot to be excited about with the potential for the series and something that I felt was a long time coming. So I'm glad DC finally realized this is a market that they could tap into to continue these stories that so many fans of these characters know and love and for a lot was some of their first exposure to these characters in batman and superman and it's just a great way for these stories to continue and we see we saw it with batman uh, 1966 that comic series that led to two animated movies which were a lot of fun so maybe if this is successful we can get 
an animated movie of Batman of the Tim Burton Batman, which I think would be awesome. Just get Michael Keaton to do the voice. I'm sure he'd be up for that. So the potential for more stories set in the Tim Burton Batman universe is here and I think is really exciting. And I could see it happening too if this is successful. I don't I think it'll only be a matter of time before we get a continuation of the Dark Knight trilogy in a comic series. I mean ever since the Dark Knight Rises ended, <laughs> I think people were kind of hoping or wondering of the possibilities of continuing the story of John Blake as Batman post Dark Knight Rises. And I think that story is coming too eventually down the line. The further we get away from the movies and people look back on things with nostalgia, I think uh, that's when we're going to be getting, well, that's where we see these stories continue. And next year is going to be 10 years after the Dark Knight Rises. So uh, the Dark Knight Rises or the Dark Knight trilogy is kind of in that time period where we're several years away from a decade and 15 years, 16 years past the Batman begins. So uh, we're, the years are going by for that series to a point where uh, that nostalgia factor will be kicking in to maybe get more stories there. So, um, yeah, I just think the potential for so much stuff in these movie universes where you previously thought you wouldn't get any more stories is now there in this comic form. And I just love that DC is doing this. So, yeah, I think this has become probably my most anticipated new comic for the year of 2021. I can't wait for this to come out, just like how the new Batman I keep saying the new Batman Adventures, but it's Batman The Adventures Continue of the animated series continued on. That was so well done, and I'm expecting the same for this one. So, yeah, really cool news to get um, a few weeks ago, and it's just going to be awesome to get that first issue when it finally does come out. And you mentioned uh, Clayface Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, the animated series, and you reminded me of uh, one scene that used to always scare me as a kid. (laughs) <laughs> but, uh, his, his face the, would be falling apart and then yeah. he'd put the face cream on uh-huh. yeah. oh so always... I was actually expecting you to say the moment at the very end where he's looking at all the TV monitors and he's just going crazy can't control his transformation and he's just uh, changing it to all the different actors and people he uh, transformed into over the course of the episode but it actually wasn't that yeah probably that too I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, I can almost yeah i i'm pretty sure that that scared me too um also <laughs> uh uh two-face the, the two-face two-parter uh, uh you, you know like they sort of portray him as like having sort of uh, mental problems before he becomes two-face mm-hmm. and, like he, he would just snap uh that used to also scare me for some reason <laughs> yeah, it was pretty some pretty serious stuff for a yeah. kids tv show at the time man. <laughs> yeah, he was talking about mental illness i know right uh, <laughs> that's uh, why i know yeah. yeah yeah um but yeah anyway that's our featured topic for this episode um tim is definitely looking forward to this being the big 89 guy he is he played the video game um non-stop i'm sure uh listen but to i never beat it though <laughs> yeah never beat it um, Only got to the last level and couldn't make it to the final boss. <laughs> you, you know, that's the thing that uh, I, I sort of miss about uh, video games now. I don't know if it's because I'm an adult, you know, better hand eye coordination or whatever, but I've, I've rarely come, come across a video game where it's like I, I just cannot beat that final stage. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the only one that. that uh, I, I can sort of think of is Arkham. Is it Arkham Origins? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Deathstroke, right? Yeah, yeah, Deathstroke with the uh, uh, sort of like the uh, what do you call that, Tim? Um, I don't know. Uh, where you have to press the button at the exact right time, like the quick time uh, event. Quick time event, right? Right? Yeah, the quick time event. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, was, that was tough. Time. Everyone had a tough time with that one. Yeah. But yet yeah, we still beat it. <laughs> yeah, that's the only one I can think of. There have been some other. hard, like secret bosses that I like a year ago, like some of the Kingdom Hearts games, especially for Kingdom Hearts three. This last year had their DLC yeah. came out, and they just had this really secret, super hard boss to beat. And it took me forever <laughs> to beat him. Sure. I almost it was kind of I had to do it. What was that? 
like embarrassingly long like yeah. it's a simple thing but like you just cannot get it done yeah he it was one of those bosses that do these cheap moves sometimes that would uh, do like an instant kill or kill you with like two hits it was, yeah, just, right, right. it was one of these things where like man i had to almost like for a good portion of the fight spam this one summon move that would kind of trap him and it would t- wouldn't take do a lot of damage so i had to do it a few times to get him down to, to take him out so it was like i had to use this uh little mermaid summon <laughs> right summon area <laughs> if you like come out of the ground is like I like diving into the ocean and just kept trapping him and getting him in the air to where I could do some damage. You kind of had to do that a lot, but yet that uses your magic meter. So you had to refill that. And it was a long and you'd get close sometimes. And then he'd do a cheap move and just get you. And you just have to start all over and go, ah, yeah, but I beat him. Uh, <laughs> the, the only other one I can think of is, um, cause you brought up, uh, kingdom hearts is, uh, final fantasy 10. Uh-huh. It's it's one of the bosses. I, I can't remember which specific boss it was, but it was the boss after the wedding scene. Okay, uh, so, sort of after the wedding scene. Um, I just could not beat that. It, it was like a big, tall monster thing. Is it one that was kind of not, in the air, like you're on your airship? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I yeah, I just could not beat him. So I had to go around and get everybody's uh, summons. And because um, it was summons in that game, it wasn't limit breaks, right? I believe there was both. I think that limit breaks and oh, summons. There was? Yeah, definitely summons because yeah. summons were such a huge part of the story. Yeah, yeah, I had to get everybody's summons, everybody's limit breaks, go back, and then just unload on the on the <laughs> box. Uh, that that's the only one I can really think of. Yeah. Yeah. Well. But, Games were a lot tougher back in the day, like the NES and Super NES, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, but, but 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 was it harder because we were young, or was it hard because they were actually harder? I think it was hard because they're actually harder. Just yeah. as just how the game designs were back then, and not having any like strategy yeah. guide or YouTube videos to go to <laughs> to try to figure it out or get any strategies, you had to do it oh, all. Yeah, you. yeah, you had to figure it out by yourself. Yeah. Um, also, the it, it, is it Scorpion? In um, is that the name of the the, the Spider-Man villain? Uh-huh. Is it Scorpion? In uh, the the um, the the Marvel Spider-Man game for PS4, that one gave me a hard time. But really, I, yeah, I, I figured it out. Yeah, hmm. yeah, I, I don't remember having too much of an issue with any of the bosses in that game. They were they're all fun though, he, but <laughs> yeah. Because he would do the uh, sort of like uh, hallucination thing, and then he he would disappear. Yeah, yeah, that that sort of thing like just threw me off. But you know, uh, yeah, I was just thinking about that. It's like like I haven't come across a game where I couldn't beat it. Like like Miles Morales, I had no problem beating it. Um, and and that's sort of in the same quick time event sort of thing. Like yeah. Uh, Arkham Origins or first uh, Spider-Man game, so yeah. Yeah, anyway. if, you're real, if you're looking for real challenges, go back to those old NES games. <laughs> yeah, and then you'll you, you'll never play them again. Yeah, you'll be so frustrated. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's our featured topic for this episode. Now we can get out to some news. Um, uh, our one and only piece of news is something that I kind of misinterpreted. Um, uh, and that is uh, that Tanahisi Coates is gonna be writing a Superman reboot movie for Warner uh, Warner Brothers. Uh, I I initially thought he was gonna do um, a comic book because oh, he, really? he, he writes comics, right? He, <laughs> yeah. He, uh-huh. Or he wrote comics for Marvel, right? What, yeah. Wasn't it uh, uh, Black Panther? He yeah, I believe he did Captain America too. Oh, he did. Oh. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, I, th- I initially thought this was a, a, a comic project, but but yeah, it's it, it's good to see uh, that he is writing a Superman reboot. Hopefully, this goes through. Hopefully, this is made. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a sort of disappearing act. It, it's a good sign when it is being reported by the trades and the actual writer is quoted to, to say that he's writing it. Is exciting to do it. <laughs> 
So that's always a good sign that it's going to happen, yeah. <laughs> unlike some other previously DC announcements. Right. And also, too, it's coming from being produced by J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot. And there's been talks and rumors about him developing a Superman movie ever since he made that deal with Warner Brothers about a year or two ago. So it looks like that is finally happening, which is going to be cool. But I remember when this came out yesterday, there was a, I, I'd seen on social media like conflicting reports about this because I believe in Deadline's article, I think they were the one that had the first report on it, is how it made a notion or a quote saying how Ken, Henry Cavill is eager to get back into the, playing Superman, or in the article says back into the cape, making you believe that it's going to continue on with Henry Cavill. But then you hear other reports coming out how they're saying how they maybe want to fo- focus on having a black Superman and maybe doing the Calvin Ellis version of Superman, who was first introduced um, back in the big final crisis, like around 2008, 2009 by Grant Morrison. I remember reading that character in Final Crisis, but and then he kind of don't know exactly what stories and issues, but he did continue on in other stories. It was like the Superman who was kind of based off Barack Obama. Um, so I don't know if they're going to go that route with it and still what? have it be in the DC yeah. continuity movie universe with yeah. Henry Cavill. So I don't know. There's a few different ways that this potential... I don't, I don't know if I even want to use reboot. They use reboot for every article now without knowing the meaning of the word. So it might not be a reboot in the sense where they're starting all over, but yet they could still be set with Henry Cavill's Superman, but yet to focus on a different character in that same universe and have him be the focus. So who knows? But it is just great to know that a new Superman movie is in development. Wait, so so I I, I must have missed this. So so there, there was a black Superman in Crisis? Yeah. But did you? Well, this was before we started I, podcasting together. So we didn't really talk about it, but <laughs> the final crisis when that was going on. <laughs> But yeah, I remember I if you look I up. Missed this. Yeah, you must have missed it. Yeah, because that was this one of the covers. Was like that version of Superman, Kelvin Ellis. This like he's in front of the White House, kind of ripping up the classic Superman pose of ripping up his shirt with the Superman logo on there, and it, you could really tell it's based off Barack Obama there. And really? I believe he is president in that story too. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I see him now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've I've never seen this Superman. Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've never. Done, I'll be honest with you, I've never seen this Superman before. But yeah, they, I guess Michael B. Jordan would fit into that role. <laughs> uh yeah, I got it. His name was yeah. rumored about like a year ago as well, kind of developing a story yeah, with him. Yeah. So yeah, that was cool to get. But then again, you saw all the reactions online. Like, man, the reactions for any Superman production is just crazy Trump. obviously you got the reaction of people who you know don't want to see anyone else as superman other than henry cavill right now and then you, even before this got announced he had the arguments about the new superman and lois tv show that just premiered which by the way was really good it was actually better than i was expecting basing off the cw <laughs> dc show yeah. because i haven't watched any since the last episode of arrow and the infinite crisis crossover um i kind of gave up on them especially when I felt Crisis was kind of a nice wrap-up of everything. But it's a new Superman show. I like Tyler Hoshin's portrayal of Clark and Superman, so I wanted to check this out. And it was actually really good. It was actually focused more on his family, and I was a little worried about the show's dynamic with having with Superman and Lois having two teenage boys. Uh, but Because I was hoping they'd go more of the Rebirth comic route, where it was Lois, Clark, and their young son, Jonathan, who was like 10 or 11, 12, somewhere around that age. But in this series, they're teenagers, they're like around 15, 16. But the, their family dynamic worked really well in the series. Something different for a Superman story where Superman wasn't really the focus. There wasn't that much action. But the, the, these episodes really didn't need it. And basically, <laughs> to be honest, also too, just how the budget and the effects are for the CW TV shows, it might be best not to have that many action sequences because <laughs> they don't necessarily look that great. But what they had in this episode featuring Superman was just enough. But that wasn't the strongest aspect. It was just how Clark was and Lois were dealing with what was going on with their family and their two sons. It was really, really good. So um, for right now, the Superman and Lois show has me back into watching at least one CW and DC show. And if it's anything like Arrow, The Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, hopefully 
it goes beyond just having two great seasons and then falling off <laughs> once it gets to the third and beyond. So we'll see how that plays out. But going back to my original point, when that aired, there was just so much online debate and just arguing over Tyler Hoshin's Superman versus Henry Cavill and the one's better than the other. And if you like the TV version, you like a Superman that's only for little kids and Henry Cavill's versions for the sophisticated <laughs> adult mature audience who loves Superman. It's just like ridiculous <laughs> stuff. And then once this got announced, it just started all over again. So, so Superman <laughs> fandom on social media isn't the best to interact with <laughs> i should say oh uh, so so the lois and clark superman is for people that aren't sophisticated and henry cavill is for the sophisticated superman fans that sure audiences yes. uh, <laughs> it, well <laughs> yeah i I'm just trying to think of like a comparison I could make to like, like Batman, right? Uh, <laughs> they're the, I mean, Adam West, but but that serves its own meaning, right? That's like the sort of campy '60s style. Yeah, it, it knew what it was. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it knew it was a parody, right? But like, <laughs> that's so. That's so stupid. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty ridiculous the last few days. <laughs> just seeing it all over my feet. But it's just so funny how people claim to be the fan of this character who's all about, you know, optimism and seeing the good in everybody and just being the best person it can be. And everyone acts, I shouldn't say everyone, but uh, a good majority of so called Superman fans acts the opposite of what the character stands for and is all about. <laughs> it just gets ridiculous to see sometimes on there. So, so if, if Henry Cavill is for the sophisticated Superman fans and the Lois and Clark version is for the sort of unsophisticated, it, who is Christopher Reeve for? Yeah, that's again. Probably the ones they probably the ones who are just hardcore Henry Cavill fans who only see him as Superman would probably look at the Christopher Reeve, Reeves ones the same way as not being the mature version of the character that they want, and probably more the one that's for younger audiences or quote unquote. Really? <laughs> but <laughs> at least if, is... if there's some that feel that way, I at least hope they have the respect for Christopher Reeve what he did for the character and just comic book movies yeah. in general. I at least hope that, but. Some of the way I've seen people online uh, act towards the, <laughs> the, ver- the Henry Cavill version of Superman wouldn't surprise me if they don't view Christopher Reeves that way. But uh, that's that's what that's what boggles my mind. You got all these different iterations of the character that you can choose from and and to watch and to enjoy. There's just no reason to pit them against each other, fans against fans of what they like. It's just you. One could be your favorite, obviously, but just to look down so mightily at one version of the character and just view it as, you know, so less superior to your favorite is just, <laughs> it's just ridiculous to have that strong of opinion of it when you could just enjoy these different versions. And just to be thankful that we have these different versions of the character out there to enjoy, that's the most important part um, that you should be thankful for, that you do have these options for it, so, but... Seems like certain fans just can't see it that way. My favorite is the Fleischer um, Superman. He didn't say anything. He just sort of. <laughs> there's actually stuff. there's actually a nice nod to that in the Superman and Lois TV show in the beginning, where they show oh, really? Superman's kind of first appearance in Metropolis, and his costume is pretty much exactly like the Fleischer cartoon version. Oh. It was pretty fun. Oh, that's cool. Um. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I didn't see this before, but our other piece of news is <laughs> uh, probably the biggest news is, um, uh, or at least right now, is that the, the Snyder Cut trailer has released. Um, I'm sure you have like 800 things to say about it, Tim. Um, Not really, because to be uh, honest, we kind of talked about it in our last episode where they were releasing the preview clips of the trailer because the trailer dropped the day after we recorded our last episode. And those were really the biggest new shots that they revealed that uh, ones that were worth talking about, in my opinion, because there was a lot of old footage from the first trailer kind of mixed in there. 
Um, but the one I really just wanted to focus on when talking about it is obviously the last moment of the trailer where we actually see and hear Jared Leto's Joker in Zack Snyder's Justice League. And we were talking about that image that was released, which how much we love this look of the Joker. And I got to say, seeing it in motion, the actual footage and hearing his voice, too, and his dialogue. It was a Joker that was totally different from what we got in Suicide Squad. <laughs> and <laughs> I already like it so much better <laughs> than what we got of Jared Leto's performance in Suicide Squad. And I, mean, I don't know how long he's going to be in the movie and with just a little bit of dialogue we got here. But this was kind of something I think I was imagining of what Jared Leto could do with the Joker when he was initially cast than kind of what we got in Suicide Squad. So I really like what I saw and heard of this version of his Joker here. And I'll be completely honest, everyone was talking about his bit of dialogue where he goes, we live in a society. And apparently that was a big meme that went around the last few years of the Joker saying that. And I I'm just must not be caught up on meme pop culture <laughs> and be bad because I never came across that or maybe did and just never paid attention to it but I never knew it was such a big meme and that line of dialogue was just kind of a nod to that meme in here so that flew over my head I didn't notice anything about that until I saw the social media reaction but I just thought it was a cool little piece of dialogue and just interaction that Joker was having with Batman there were um Obviously, he's in the nightmare sequence, and I think that's where all we're going to see Joker of in Zack Snyder's Justice League. But um, just being excited from that first teaser image we got to now seeing and hearing what his Joker is going to be in the movie, I just really, really liked it a lot. So um, regardless of how much he's in it, it's probably just going to be some cool little moments of this version of the Joker in uh, Justice League. So I thought that was probably the standout moment of the new trailer that dropped about two weeks ago. You know what? My... Uh, and. I'm going to surprise you, Tim. My sort of opinion about this Justice League Snyder Cut, tra- uh, Snyder Cut film mm-hmm. has kind of changed over the past I don't know, week and a half. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's... I don't think it's... I still don't think it's going to be a good, uh, a good movie. But what I do appreciate it for is that it's... And, and there was a good article, I, I want to say by Variety or Entertainment Weekly. Um, oh, there is a Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair, right. About, yeah, this came about, out this week. Yeah, About Snyder and sort of what happened. And, you know, I kind of feel for the guy. And it's, yeah. It's, um, you know, my opinion has kind of changed because it, it, it's sort of like, a, let's, let's throw everything I ever imagined into this thing. Mm-hmm. And see what see what we get, right? Let's throw it into a four hour movie or whatever it is, and let's see what we get at the end. And you know, uh, I, I gotta respect it and I gotta appreciate it because you know it's it's uh, like I said, I don't think it's gonna make the movie any better. I don't think it's gonna make my opinion of the movie any better. But I can appreciate that. You know, he's, he is coming back and he is going to try to get his vision of what he wants into the movie, even though it's going to be a four hour movie. It sounds like he's adding a whole bunch of stuff. You know, they spent like $70 million trying to redo this thing. And, you know, I, I, I think I'll watch it. Tim. I'm not sure if I'll watch it in one sitting. Like, <laughs> I'll be shocked if you're able to do, do that. <laughs> uh, but, but I can. Right now, I, I can appreciate what it's what he's trying to do, you know. Yeah. So I I, I got to give him that. Um, and let, let let's put his name on it, you know. And let's sort of forget about Joss Whedon, mm. <laughs> uh, you know, especially with what he's going through now with all these yeah. allegations and stuff. The further so, away it, it gets from Josh Whedon, the better. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, you know, I can appreciate it for that. And, you know, I, I'll, it's, uh, I'm not going to analyze it. You know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to watch it like how I watch, you know, anything else where it's just like, let's see what he does. 
you know, let's let, let's go on this adventure. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, definitely. So, yeah. And and for anyone who hasn't read that article on Vanity Fair, it was a really fascinating read, and it's a great article, like you said, just how everything went down with Zack Snyder leaving the project and how Warner Brothers was treating him and what they were doing to, in their eyes, make the movie better, which obviously kind of backfired on him. And they ended up (laughs) going to what they originally had to do with having Zack Snyder be in control of this movie, which again is great for him after what he had to go through and just from starting this. And we said this before when the, this is this version of Justice League was coming out of how you want to see a director fulfill his vision of what he had planned and just for everything that went down for how, uh, he wasn't able to do that from the loss of his daughter uh, being the focal point and then just how Warner Brothers was kind of treating the whole situation. It's just really good to see him get this opportunity to do that. And at the end of the day, that's what I'm most glad and happy about for those Zack Snyder Justice League being released. Like you said, Dane, jury's still out as far as what the final product of the movie will be and how I'll think of it. I'm excited for it. Everything I'm seeing for it, I think looks really cool. But again, we'll have to wait and see when we see the whole four hour cut of it. Um, but even if I don't end up enjoying it as much as I hope I will, I'll always just be glad that it's out there and Zack Snyder got this chance to uh, complete his vision of the story that he started back in Man of Steel. Because if anyone who does anything creatively, uh, if you don't get that opportunity, it probably something that will stick with you and maybe irk you <laughs> a little bit down the line. So the fact that he's able to finish that is just really great for him. So, yeah, definitely a great read. So check that out on Vanity Fair. Um uh, came out, I believe, earlier this week. So we just some um, yeah. as we get closer to the release of the movie to kind of get you more excited and I guess aware of it <laughs> once it comes out. So we're just a few weeks away now, and I'm definitely eagerly anticipating to watch hopefully all four hours of it on one night. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that, Tim. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, you, unless you have like the the world's best attention span, I mean, well, that's I, I don't not... think you're sitting down for, yeah. That's not a problem for me. I'll have no uh, issues not keeping my attention. My problem is being able to stay awake if you know it's after a, a work day. I'm thinking of maybe t- if I should take that Friday off because it's actually coming out on a Thursday. I won't be able to watch it Thursday night unless I take that following Friday off. <laughs> but I just want to make sure if that's after a long work day, I'm not dozing off if I get a late start on watching it <laughs> on like the third hour or something like that. Yeah, maybe you should. <laughs> Maybe you should pick that Friday off so you don't have to worry. Um, also, surprisingly, he he didn't take a salary for for redoing this. Yeah, that's he right. Free. Yeah. Again, that just shows you the passion and desire that he had to finish the story that he wanted to <laughs> to tell originally. So again, that's just great for him to do that. Just yeah. putting aside that aspect of it, and just not only that, but also giving the fans what they want, who were clamoring for it. So it's kind of a good a good gesture by him and not making it all just about money and the production side of things, but just mainly from the creative and fan side of things to get the story out there. Yeah, four hours, man. I'll be honest, I don't think I can do it. <laughs> um, yeah. Because even with the, the, the Wonder Woman 88 or 84, uh, that almost felt like four hours in some moment. <laughs> yeah. it, it was Wonder Woman 84, right? Yeah. Yeah. My, my mind was wandering all over the place. <laughs> um, especially uh, those scenes in Egypt and mm. stuff. Like, I just, you know, it's like, what? Well, I couldn't concentrate on uh, on the movie, you know? So. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, anyway. I hear you on that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's go to our comic book reviews. Uh, I cannot wait for this. Because it's, <laughs> oh, yes. it's a book that I've been waiting for for a long time. I mean, uh, uh, looking forward to reviewing. Um, and that's going to be the last Roman in number two. Uh, and our rating scale for this episode is going to be, uh, let's see, uh, times Dane's mine wandered off while watching one woman 84 <laughs> there you go <laughs> uh so tim why don't you kick us off on uh, the last Ronin? yeah so the last Ronin. i should say it's the teenage mutant ninja turtles the last running issue two oh which yeah right for anyone who's not acquainted with the tmnt comics so 
how this is one the story is kind of a future telling of what kind of almost like the last story of the TMNT where there's only one turtle left out for revenge in honor of his clan where the turtle family is pretty much all gone. They're all dead and there's only one turtle left. And in issue one, that was a big secret too, leading up to the series um, because it is coming from an original story idea from the creators, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. And it's finally being developed into a comic series um, with them involved and with Tom Waltz, the writer of the, Obviously, amazing IDW run in the first 100 issues anyway. But the series is still continuing strong with Sophie Campbell and her run that's going on right now, which has been phenomenal. But this is kind of more of a what-if future um, scenario, what would happen to the Turtles. And the last one, surviving Turtle is Michelangelo. And just seeing just what a different character he's become and just kind of how a darker version of Michelangelo we're seeing. He's more like a Raphael than the party dude michelangelo that uh, we're so familiar with so it's just kind of such a great turnaround for the character and just a fascinating darker turn and look for the turtles and the story so um yeah. issue two man this was a brutal issue man <laughs> um just from where it starts off we see april as an older older woman now and we just see her lying in bed tears coming down her eyes and we get a flashback sequence to kind of what led to this whole dark scenario of the state of New York and the state of the turtle family and just how it all went down. Um, just seeing her and Casey at her, uh, at her apartment or her family pawn shop second time around, um, the classic uh, location that the O'Neill family had and just how That's Raphael, a great name, by the way, yeah, for, <laughs> for, a, yeah. for a pawn shop, yeah. Pawn shop. Yeah. I was going to say antique shop. But... Well, yeah, I you can call it that too. Yeah. It is in the first, uh, 1990 TMNT movie there too as well so it's a yes, staple it <laughs> but just seeing Raphael burst into there bleeding crashing like clearing off the dinner table and then you see Donatello and Michelangelo bring pretty much a dead body of Splinter who's just barely hanging on to life and just putting him on the table there's just blood everywhere and how they were saying they were ambushed by the Foot Clan it just they took him by surprise and what really caught him off guard was that the turtle clan we were supposed to have a truce set up with the foot and the foot broke that. And they just totally took the turtles by surprise and just did a number on Splinter who uh, they ended up killing. And once we get past, that was just the first bit of the flashback, but then we just see April come out of her bed and then we see she's missing several limbs, one on her arm and one on her leg. And now she's grabbing her prosthetics and it just makes you think, man, what, happened to all of our favorite characters here <laughs> and yeah. to come to the such a bleak future scenario and that's what just stood out to me in this issue is in that the flows flashback moments and just this is probably one of the most brutal turtle comics i've ever read just not only seeing the brutality of the action the violence that happens in here just but just seeing the toll it took on the characters like april both emotionally and physically like april and michelangelo it's just such fascinating stuff as reading in a turtle comic and you just one of the best aspects in this issue and the first one and i think it's going to be the case throughout the series is the mental state of michelangelo and how he's in his mind having conversations with his other three brothers and in his mind how they're viewing him now as the last the last ronin <laughs> given to the title the last one to try to honor their clan and just the mental stability of michelangelo here what he's dealing with it's just fascinating stuff because they even one of the big things that stood out to me when he's having this conversation in his head with Raphael and just re kind of recapping everything that's happened and Raphael in his, again in Michelangelo's mind made the point says like when they were talking about what happened Raph just says at least I didn't try to off myself at the first whiff of failure just that idea of Michelangelo yeah, no. suicide man it's just crazy <laughs> yeah <laughs> So many great yeah, stuff. And uh, uh, another thing I really liked about this comic book, it's kind of around this time, is when uh, you know Raph goes out and he he gets attacked by the Foot Clan, mm. and um, Karai, it's uh, and, and he he's overwhelmed. You know, he he's just one person, and he he's overwhelmed by all these Foot Clan soldiers, and he dies. Yeah, you know, it's like, and, and it's it's like this huge moment that 
you know, he dies, but the, the way they write it, the way it's drawn, it's not, it's sort of like, okay, well, he's dead. And, and you see his, um, he, I, I forget his weapon. Well, what the was sigh. it called? The sigh, right? You see the sigh slowly drift down into the water. Um, yeah, it's, it, it just sort of struck me like, oh, he's dead? Like, th- that was his death scene? Like, I almost didn't believe it when I first saw it because it's it's a brutal death. Uh, you know, he, he has, like, like a hundred arrows in his, yeah. all over his body. He's being attacked. He's stabbed. Um, and, yeah, it's it's so brutal. Uh, it's so brutal. Like, like, like how Michael Agile, Mikey wanted to kill himself you know after all this happened and it's like it, it, it almost doesn't hit the same way as a batman comic or if you saw it in a superman comic you know it's 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 so so far away from that where it's 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 it makes it even more sad where it's like yeah. you have this positive character that you know all he does is look at the positive and the half uh, you know the the glass half full sort of character, and then you, the the most optimistic character in all the comic books and all the media, and then you have him, you know he he wants to kill himself, and then you, you, you on top of that you also have you know Wrath dying, and it's it, it just hits differently, right? It's it's, it's not totally. the same. yeah for, for me anyway, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Man, the artwork for that sequence of that battle Raph had with Karai on the foot, it was phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like you said, Raph gets like tons of arrows on him. He's bloody, but man, he takes out a lot of foot soldiers with him. <laughs> it just made for just a really cool drawn and laid out uh, sequence in this comic for Raph in his final moments here. And him and Karai going underwater, they both stab each other. He stabs Karai in the back and she stabs him through the like underneath the neck. I mean, like I said, it is brutal. Yeah. And, Sad to see the final moments of Rav. And then I think we're going to get in each subsequent issue, we're kind of going to see the fates of the rest of the Turtle family. We'll probably see Donatello next and then Leonardo. What happens to Casey Jones and April, how she lost her arm and leg. So uh, more brutal stuff is on the way, <laughs> sad to say. But again, it's just going to make you feel and be more emotionally impactful to see what Michelangelo is going through in the story and why he is the way he is. And some other interesting notes as he's talking with April over a cup of tea, just how um, the, his mutated body has changed. Like the older he gets, I guess the stronger the mutation is because he's talking about how the fall he had in issue one should have killed him. But um, the mutation has progressed over the years and it's making him bigger and stronger and just more powerful, really, <laughs> than they were as teenage mutant ninja turtles, now as adult mutant ninja turtles. <laughs> but the other reveal we get here is we see April call out for Casey, but it's not Casey Jones. It's April and Casey's daughter, who uh, is named Casey Marie Jones, um, which is kind of a cool a little surprise there. And how yeah. she's involved in this underground resistance against uh, the last, uh, or I should say the Foot Clan that's in power. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now, but the family member, the legacy of Oroku Saki. I don't know if it's his great-grandson, his grandson. I can't remember, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Yeah, but he I is, think it's... I think it's Karai's son. Okay, yeah. so, so it'd be uh, Shredder's grandson. Grandson, right, yeah. So, yeah, he's in charge of pretty much all of New York and the Foot Clan, and uh, they're just an underground resistance that uh, April and her daughter Casey are trying to stand up against, and now they got Michelangelo involved. And then we get to probably my favorite part of the issue, where Michelangelo talks about what happened after... He lost all his family and everything went down and just how he dealt with it. And I was not expecting this, but once I turned the page to that flashback moment and it was drawn by Kevin Eastman, the yeah. obviously the original creator and artist for those original comics. And it went back to that old black and white art style. I just thought, oh man, <laughs> this is just amazing to get. Um, again, powerful story beats with Michelangelo. It was almost like he was pulling a Luke from the Last Jedi moment here. How he wanted to go off into the wilderness and just die, just wait for death. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Until he, I, was I, I love this art style. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's it's super hard to look at, but that's it, what makes it great, if, though. <laughs> yeah, if, if if you look 
hard enough at it, you'll see the image. Is it, it doesn't come to you automatic like how you, your random comic book artist in a comic book, you know, in a mainstream comic book, I'd say, uh, would look. But if 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 it's almost abstract in a way where it's like it just looks like a bunch of lines, bunch of like I don't know what you call it, like square lines, and then if you look like a little, if if you look hard at it. It, the picture will come through and, and <laughs> it'll match um, M- Michelangelo's uh, narration. Yeah. Mm. I, I totally loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great, brilliant way to do a flashback sequence. One is such as important as this is what Michelangelo was going through and how he kind of had to regain his mental stability and go back to what he needed to do and be a ninja and fight for his clan's honor again. And just to learn all these different uh, skills and forms of martial arts that he took from one of like Splinter's uh, books that he mentioned here. And just really train himself like never before uh, to become a Ronin and to restore his family honor and just be so dead set on taking that revenge off of uh, Rokisaki's descendant who's in charge of the Foot Clan here. That just goes back to the original TMNT first issue where the whole point of that was the turtles getting revenge for Hamato Yoshi and taking out Shredder, a.k.a. Rokusaki, in that issue. And this is kind of harkening back to that. It made me remind me of that as well, which is really cool. And I forgot to mention, too, um, the brief cameo at the beginning where we're getting the sequence with Raphael, uh, where I believe he's going through a subway, and you see these two characters in there. That's saying, (laughs) you see that? It looks like a what? Yeah, never mind. It's too crazy. And it's actually Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Again, just such great nods to the creators here and just uh, using not only that, but then using them for to tell the story in the art style as well in that flashback. It's uh, such great stuff. The, the issue kind of ends with Michelangelo talking with uh, Casey and then saying how, you know, I don't know who you remind me more of, your mother or your father. <laughs> and then the final page is we see April kind of go into this storage safe and pulls out the head of the Fugitoid, who Turtle fans will remember was from uh, an alien doctor, Professor Honeycutt, who's transported or transported his mind into uh, a robotic body. So I don't know how he's going to be utilized here moving forward in this story, but it definitely has me peaked as far as what the future, what role the Fugitoid is going to play in this issue moving forward. But man, this issue is even better than the first one, which was already great. But from the artwork, the flashbacks, and just the diving into the emotional and mental state of Michelangelo, man, it was just so great. And again, unlike any other Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics that I've read before, they're just so, so, so good. <laughs> it just makes me eagerly anticipate the next few issues because like we said i think it's going to get even more rough and brutal for the other members of the turtle family to see their fates and what happened to them Um, but hopefully it'll lead to a happy ending with michelangelo restoring the clan's honor and taking down uh the foot in this story but man i just can't wait but i'm sad to say i think the release schedule um isn't your typical monthly release obviously this one came out a few months after the first one so i should probably look up but i'm not sure exactly if there is a set release schedule for it or they're just putting them out once they're ready to go. So it might be a couple of months before we get the next issue. But if this oh, one's no. any indication, it's going to be worth the wait without question. So um, I'm going to give this issue five out of five times that Dane's mind wandered through Wonder Woman 1984. So your mind was wandering a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering what happened. I mean, why does April have prosthetics and what happened to Casey oh, like what happened to the other turtles and what is this attack this foot clan attack you know so yeah I'm I'm gonna give this five out of five too five out of five times my mind went crazy or my mind uh wandered during 1084 um I I totally love this this book it, it's 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 amazing um I, I can't believe how far they are from, you know, the TV, the animated TV show. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny to think about that original 87 cartoon yeah. and this story. 
I, I can't believe how far away it is from that. And again, I say it every time. If you told me, Tim, <laughs> my favorite book right now would be the, the TMNT mainline titles and The Last Ronin. I would have called you crazy, <laughs> but it is, it is. And it's the only comics I read nowadays. Um, yeah, I just cannot recommend this highly enough. Um, I'm sure you, you, are the, you are the same way. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, at I, this I, point, totally it's going to be hard for any other book to top this one this, this year anyway. Again, yeah. I'm excited for Batman 1989 for that story to continue. But um, right now, TMNT, The Last Ronin, it's just on another level for anything else I'm currently reading right now. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it for our episode. Um, one other piece of news, Tim, I forgot to mention during our news section. Um, Anthem is gone. It's oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you're so broken hearted about that. Dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're not going to update it anymore. They're not going to uh, relaunch it. It's uh, Bioware is going to put their sort of uh, put all Focus. of their teams on <laughs> Mass Effect <laughs> and Dragon Age. So, yeah, that's gone. Yeah, probably uh, time and energy more well spent on those properties than Anthem. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. <dude. laughs> yeah, that's probably true. You're probably doing that. Um, but yeah, that's it from us. Uh, go to BatmanUniverse.net, Facebook.com, social Batman Universe, Twitter handle is at Batman Universe, the show's Twitter handle is at Batman's Podcast, Tim's Twitter handle is at TimG311, my Twitter handle is at Aces Banana. Rate your reviews on iTunes, and you can email the show at Batman's and all pants at gmail.com. So, that like we see at the end of every single episode of Tim. We love each and every one of you, with all of our sad, broken turtle hearts. Oh. oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, we'll see you guys next time, buddy. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs> Son-